Okay, just a reminder to turn off our cell phones if you have them on right now. I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order. This is the Board of Education for the School District of Waukesha, February 10th, 2021. Thank you for joining us tonight and we'll begin uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, the to the flag of the, of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So will you please uh, call the roll? William Baumgart. Here. Corey Montillo. Here. Greg Dietz. Here. Amanda Roddy. Here. Diane Voigt. Here. Patrick McCaffrey. Here. Kurt O'Brien. Here. Karen Reinecek. Here. Joseph Como. Here. Thank you, Sue. And will you also um, let us know if we were properly posted? Yes, we were. Thank you. Uh, for the inspirational moment tonight, uh, I have a quote from uh, Alexander Graham Bell. When one door closes, another opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the door, upon the closed door, that we do not see the one which has opened for us. Let's look for the open doors. Moving on to bright lights. Dr. Siebert, um, we have some exciting news with respect to AVID at a couple of our high schools. We you want to share that with us? Oh, I would love to, Mr. Como. Thank you. So both North and South high schools have been recognized as AVID school-wide sites of distinction, which is incredible. And an AVID school-wide site of distinction is the highest rating that a school can achieve within the AVID certification continuum. And AVID school-wide sites of distinction are recognized for implementing AVID with high levels of fidelity and demonstrating that AVID positively impacts students across the entire campus, not just within the AVID elective class. And so South has been an AVID site of distinction since 2019, and North achieved this challenging status this year in 2020. So we certainly want to congratulate them on their hard work as they continue to close the opportunity gap for all of their students. And I just want you, wanted to briefly highlight that today. You're going to hear more about it from the self students who talk to you tonight. They're going to have it in their presentation. And then at the March 10th board meeting, you'll hear about it from the North student representatives. And we'll also have Amanda Wagner and the principals here to talk more specifically about some of the reasons that the school's qualified for this and why it's so impressive that they are two of only six sites in the entire state of Wisconsin that earn this distinctive recognition. So we should all be very, very proud of them. That is fan fantastic, yes. Absolutely. Round yes. of applause for him. Yes. Ho hopefully they're out there in TV, TV land. Okay. <laughs> and you also have um, uh, some more information to share with us tonight. Uh, who's gone the extra mile? And we know lots of us have gone the extra mile this last month, but we want to point out a particular group. Who is that? Well, thank you, Mr. Como. And yes, that is the second portion of our recognition under bright lights. And this evening, going the extra mile, we are proud to recognize Mr. Schloman and the technology department. So if you really think about, we're coming up on the year anniversary almost of school closing down and the COVID pandemic becoming real. The work that Steve and his department have done from that time forward and specifically what I've been able to witness from July 1st to today is nothing short of miraculous. And technology has been the uniting force that's allowed us to continue to offer high quality learning opportunities in various learning modalities. And whether it's been Blackboard or WebEx or uh, the carts, the WebEx carts that we have, the list goes on and on, the things that hotspots uh, that Steve and his department have done. I just wanted to give him an opportunity to really highlight his department and to, uh, for all of us, to give him a, a huge congratulations on behalf of himself and his department. Hey, Steve. Congratulations to you and your department. Thank you. Um, I'd like to accept this honor in, in uh, 
recognition on behalf of all my teammates. I just want to um, list everybody out so that we don't forget anybody because a lot of times we, some of the folks we know, we see every day and some are behind the scenes doing work that uh, make things go. Um, so I just wanted to list everybody for it so that you would uh, remember who they are. Uh, our, our amazing instructional technology team, Wendy Liska, Brian Yearling, and Kristen Bruchard. Rashad, um, they're out in the buildings all the time. We see them all the time. Our help desk, Carla Furman and Jen Binder. Um, they're on the phones, they're on the chats, they're always working. Our technicians, Tim Mailing, Mike Sheff, and John Brzezinski, they're in the buildings as well most, most days. Our data group, uh, Ali Poff and Chris Billick are rarely in buildings, but they're always touching buildings with the data that they, they do. Our network and systems administrators, Mark, Mike Garb, Kim Trojanowski, and Don Teifke. Uh, they're the ones that make our servers and our network work and stay working. And of course, my administrative assistant, Patricia Barr, I couldn't do anything without her. And even our part-time folks are uh, Mark Blackman, who has been here forever uh, and still continues to help us with all of our video and our technology in the boardroom. Um, and Gene Waller still works with us a little bit over uh, remotely uh, for our uh, assessment stuff that she does. And of course, our co-op students, Benjamin being one of our former co-ops that's come back to help us and our exist, our, we, have, we have three current co-ops that we're working with uh, right now. And so they're amazing. Also like to thank the, uh, the library media specialists and all of the tech aides that are in the buildings and the library aides because they're on the front lines doing everything for us. Also, and last but not least, are all the teachers that have become amazing tech integrators themselves this year. They've been able to, on the front lines, trying to figure out how to make their instruction go and keep it going. Uh, we assist them, but they're really the people that have to deal with the day-to-day -day problems. And then I'd like to, in conclusion, I'd just like to say I believe I can speak for all of us um, when we say we would like to thank the school district and especially the board for your forethought in April of 2013 when you approved the Waukesha One program. In my mind, this is the single most significant event that has helped us prepare for the pandemic. So the Waukesha One program, I, st I watched the recording before I came up here of Dan Warren giving his uh, send off speech and it's truly amazing what that program has come become. So thank you for your recognition, appreciate it. Con con congratulations. Technology is one of those things that we just take for granted, right? We, it just should work, and it should work all the time, and it takes so much to, to, deliver, to deliver on that. And so what I hope people start to do is count the minutes that it works <laughs> and not the time that it's down. Would that help you out, Steve, and your team? Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kurt? Yeah, I'd just like to, you know, those are great. A great recap, and it was great to hear about Waukesha One um, from 2013. But really, we owe this way back to it was a referendum in 2005 when uh, we successfully agreed um, passed a referendum for recurring money for technology, and that has helped us build our own network, our own fiber structure, in conjunction with the city. Um, we really owe it to the community that far back, and and it made and it's paid dividends now for going on 16 years and um, they gave us enough money at the time and the cost of technology has gone down and so we've been able to do more with that money year after year so it's really a tremendous amount of appreciation to the taxpayers and agreed to do that some 16 years ago excellent anyone else want to comment okay thank you congratulations and moving on to our Employee Recognition Award, Sharon Thede, I think, is going to be unveiling our Employee of the Month. Okay, hello, good evening. 
So the Employee Recognition Award for February 2021 is being presented this evening to Sherry Bonell. So Sherry, I would say please stand up, but here you are. <laughs> okay, so Sherry started in the School District of Waukesha in 2014 as an educational assistant, and she has been the attendance secretary at West High School since 2017. Her nominators begin by saying that since day one, Sherry jumped in with new ideas on how to systematize attendance for West. She has taken ownership of the attendance system and has worked diligently to have this system operate at peak efficiency. Sherry is somebody who is always looking to do better and consistently explores new ideas for making systems better. Sherry is one of the most kind and gracious individuals you will ever meet. She takes the time with everyone to ensure they are taken care of, cookies this evening, and that they receive excellent customer service. Her kindness has a positive effect on the entire office at West, and she is a positive and supportive of her colleagues, always offering to help and truly models what it means to be a team player. Along with being kind, Sherry is also relentless in her pursuit to accomplish every task that she takes on. She is a supportive West parent, and most recently, she became the primary go-to COVID contact tracer and quarantine room supervisor. With all the unknowns surrounding COVID, it was evident that Sherry works with care for all of the students. She created systems to communicate about COVID procedures and put an extra effort to make sure students were safe. She has communicated almost single-handedly with every student or family who has questions or concerns about COVID. She has taken any ambiguity around how COVID is handled at West. She has been able to be the go-to person, leaving time for other office staff to focus on other office tasks. She has endured families experiencing a range of emotions when they get phone calls and has been courteous and professional in every instance. She is calm and wants to make sure that all staff members and students are safe. Sherry is a model worker when it comes to going above and beyond for students and fellow staff. She's a great communicator and represents West High School at the highest level as she engages with all stakeholders on a daily basis. She consistently, consistently follows up to minimize the impact of COVID and is completely invested in her work. She is an amazing human being. So on behalf of the School District of Waukesha, I would like to congratulate Sherry on being selected to receive the School District of Waukesha Employee Recognition Award. Recipe. Wow. <laughs> that one might be secret. Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I do what I do because I want to give 100% to everyone, all my families, my students, everybody I work with. Um, they are my families, you know, and I want to take care of them. Uh, but I'm only able to do what I do because I have amazing coworkers and leadership and um, people who answer my questions and I ask a lot of questions. Um, and they help me grow professionally and personally and, and it's just wonderful. I'm so grateful for the opportunities the district has provided me. I came, came in after being a stay-at-home mom for 15 years. But I've learned technology. I've I've learned how to, you know, work in the office space and um, and and get along with everyone. And um, I've worked with the nurses now and the contact tracers, the bilingual office, IT, and all the amazing staff, which helped me to round out being able to help people and knowing knowing what the whole picture looks like. Um, the faith and trust that has been given to me has been incredible. Brian is always in my corner and <laughs> he cheers me on um, and, and given me a lot of confidence just to think outside the box and, and try to innovate and, and be creative. So um, thank you to all of you and all my families and all my coworkers and I so appreciate it. Thank you.
Excellent. Yes. Yes. We have um, tonight uh, student representatives from Waukesha South, and Principal Kitzler will be uh, introducing those student reps. What's happening at South? Good evening, everyone. Well, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come uh, each semester and share with you some of the great things that we have at Waukesha South High School as well as our academies. Uh, our student presenters are the same ones that presented the first semester. So we have Naj and Roman, both part of the student council. So Naj is our public relations and Roman is our treasurer for our student council. Good evening, school board members. We hope you are doing well. Uh, Najo and I are here to discuss the awesome things going on at Waukesha South this second semester. So to start off, whoops. To start off, Waukesha South is named Avid School-Wide Site of Distinction for the second year in a row, with 70% of our teachers using Wicker strategies, which is Avid's proven learning support structure during their classroom instruction time. Um, this also includes highly trained AVID teachers within our school building, and this gives students the confidence uh, for their post-secondary plans after high school and ways of achieving those plans. Um, so AVID's goal is to close the opportunity gap for all students to achieve their goals after high school. And the AVID program has done exactly that. When you see on the, what you see on the board here is that 95% of our AVID seniors have been accepted to at least one college or university. Um, collectively, our AVID seniors have been accepted into over 200 schools, and these include universities such as University of Wisconsin-Madison, Marquette University, Westmont University, and so on. And on the right, you see our AVID senior class, as well as two students and the, and the colleges they've been accepted to thus far. Um, so here we have the Engineering Academy and the um, Health Academy student interviews. My name is Deanna Frick and I'm 11th grader. I'm a junior and I'm also in the Health Academy. I've been in Health Academy for four years. I started my freshman year. I want to be a cardiologist and I knew that I want to do something with medicine and I feel like it would be such a great advantage to just knowing that I'm focusing on exactly what I want to be and what I want to do. I'm so happy with my decision. It's helped me so much knowing my career now and knowing what I need to work on specifically to get to my goal. I'm very happy that I'm in Montana. I would say do it. My, that's my biggest advice is to do it. Um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it a few years ago when I was in eighth grade, but honestly, I'm so glad that I made that choice. to the academy because both my grandfathers and my father are engineers so I've been exposed to STEM fields kind of when I grew up and I really took a passion into those fields so I decided to take the academy to continue that passion. I would describe my experience as rewarding. You get to see a lot of different disciplines of engineering which um, overall helped me like choose what career I wanted to go into and the teachers are great and you make so many you know close friends there. It was just a wonderful experience to be a part of. 
The Academy has definitely contributed to my goals. Um, it showed me what types of engineering I like, what types I definitely didn't like, didn't want to go into, and it's put me in the position to really choose between the top two engineering schools in the state. So it put me in a great position for my career and my future. If someone was considering the Academy, I would definitely encourage them. It is a great place to explore engineering if that's your passion. So the Paper Peace Crane Project. Uh, Ms. Martin started this project last year after the incident that happened at our school as a way to open dialogue. And the Paper Crane uh, Project was started in reaction to an elementary school shooting. And the creators of the project wanted to send the message that everyone has a power to instill peace within their community. Um, keeping students busy with their hands and creating these cranes allowed them to talk about their emotions and their feelings about the incident. And so, on this year's anniversary of the incident, Ms. Martin asked if she could make cranes again for her classes. And after describing this to Mr. Gayas, the art teacher, they decided on creating a, a thousand of these uh, paper cranes. And what they did was they hung them from the ceilings of one end of the school to the other, from the art, um, the art rooms to the office rooms. And it was a success and it looked amazing. So at South, we have a National Merit Scholarship finalist. Her name is Sia Verma. She was named a semi-finalist in September and has now met all requirements to advance as a finalist for the National Merit Scholarship. So the art class, the art club and AVID elective classes are making Valentine's Day cards for the kids and each card comes with a heart-shaped crayon. Uh, the kids are at Whittier. And Student Council has also been assisting with this. And here's the website for the community project. Um, next we have athletics and activities. So something that started last semester was the Fall One Act, the day the internet died, which we mentioned it uh, last time we were here. And it involved 22 students, and it was a stage show, but unfortunately it was, the production was released virtually, so people had to purchase it and watch it at the comfort of their home, which although it was a big setback, it was still a success. Um, we also have the One Act competition selfie. Um, Aaron Loshman won Outstanding, uh, Outstanding Acting Award. This performance as a whole won Critics' Choice Award, and out of 65 performances, only 19 received this prestigious award. Um, they competed at State Virtual, oh, what just happened? Virtually December 10th and 12th. And for what's to come, you have William Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, which is a South adaptation, and it, which involves 21 cast members. And the closest uh, release of this show would be in two weeks. And for this play, there actually is a limited uh, live audience, as well as a virtual release. Um, for boys basketball this year, we have won 12 times, um, which is actually a really big accomplishment and we have lost seven times with an eight game winning streak. Um, there is a top half finish in the, cast, the Classic Eight Conference for the first time in six years, and we were seated number three, and host, we're also hosting regionals on February 16th versus Badger High School. And then for girls basketball, um, their uh, record right now is 4-16, and 16, but some notable accomplishments that were made this season was beating Muskego and the number 10th ranked New Berlin West team. And they were also seated 6 and headed to regionals to play McGuanago. So for Boys Swim and Dive, South has hosted Boys Swim Conference in sectionals and state. South sent five swimmers to state this year, and you can see their events and names down below. And this is the first time we've hosted. 
and on to the wrestling program. Um, so uh, on January 30th, 20, uh, 2021, the South Wrestling Program actually won their regional, which is the first time in 18 years that a South program has done this, as well as sending five individuals to the individual sexual uh, wrestling tournament. And also, most notably, our head coach, Ryan Green, uh, reached the 100th win milestone this season, uh, right before the regional tournament, actually. So the Waukesha Boys Varsity Ski Team has quali qualified for state for only the second time in team history. Last Thursday, the boys skied their hearts out to score enough season points to send them to state championship this coming weekend. The team placed second in their giant solemn race and South's Connor Boyle placed fourth overall. Connor, along with six other athletes from West and North comprise the state team who will race at Mount Lacrosse on Sunday. Congratulations, congratulations, Connor and the rest of the team. The girls varsity also had a strong finish to their season with Kendall Amet being South's fastest female athlete. And now for the co-ed snowboard team. So our Waukesha snowboard teams had started their season with some dominating results. This includes Leah Walters, who took the fastest women's time trial of the day, as well as six other top 10 finishes thus far. So for our spirit squad, which involves cheerleading and dance, we have over 60 students involved on four different teams. Um, for this year, we have so far produced multiple first place finishes at regional cheer and dance competitions. Um, the cheerleading large group team is prepared to defend their state title in two weeks. And for our mock trial team, they had an excellent weekend going 4-0 with a total score of 758 out of 800 poss 880 possible points scored. This means that not only did they take first in their regional competition, but they're also advancing to the state competition uh, this March, the 6th and the 7th. And in this regional, they defeated three separate Brookfield Academy teams as well as an Arrowhead team. And each regional advances only one team, and the South mock trial team will uh, be that one team competing against 10 other teams. For FBLA, which is Future Business Leaders of America, we have six students that finished in the top 10 for the regionals, which were held on Saturday, February 6th. And under this, you can see the places, what they finished in, and their names. Last but not least, we have the academic decathlon team as well as the DECA organization within our school. So for the academic decathlon team, they advanced through the first two rounds of local and regional competition to qualify for the state tournament in the 2020-2021 season for the second year in a row. This is especially phenomenal when you take into consideration that Waukesha, Waukesha South fielded its first academic decathlon team in five years last season, which they went to state for. And as well for the DECA organization within our school, Brady Boyle made it to state. And that is all. What questions might we have? Mr. Bungart. Thank you. You, an you ended up with that as all, and I said, that's a lot. <laughs> but uh, really, I was gonna compliment you on the I guess you see the breadth of experience, uh, yeah, opportunities and experiences you guys are having at South, and I was very pleased, and I know some of that has been added and growing from from prior situations. So I want to compliment on that. I just have one simple question on one of the activities to make sure I got it straight. The mock trial, is that where you, maybe you could just describe what happens in a mock trial. So it's basically like a court proceeding case. If you ever watch Law & Order, they do similar oh, yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're going to do these days. We'll watch Law & Order uh, 456 times. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. So yeah, it's basically like that where there's uh, different stages like cross-examination. and other. Th I can't really say much about it because I'm not a part of it. But I do have a new, um, um, numerous friends that are in it. And they say they are successful and enjoy it a lot. So. It is about... Law and order. It's, it's something yeah. that somebody did something wrong. It's a defense and prosecution situation. Yeah, like every year they have a, a certain scenario that happened, and uh, the students would play characters like the defendant, the witness, and then uh, the jury, and stuff like that. Great. Thank you. Mr. Ryan. So 
what I'd like to say, you know, in such a challenging year that's been for everybody, you know, across the board, it's, it's really amazing the amount of stuff that's been going on at, at our high schools and especially what I see here at South. Um, you guys had a really great year in a lot of things and, and we commend it for that as a school community that you've been able to accomplish so much. Yeah. Great step forward for South and in, in all areas. Pray for you. Mr. Montiel. Thank you. Um, you mentioned mock trial. I had the uh, privilege of acting as the uh, presiding judge for South's first competition this past Saturday morning. They were fantastic. I had no idea what schools they were. Uh, they just go by numbers. But they, it was a criminal trial. Uh, they prepared for quite a few months. Their attorney advisor is a deputy district attorney from Milwaukee County. She's amazing. Um, their student, uh, I'm sorry, their teacher coach, I forget. Uh, their name, but they're fantastic as well. And I was absolutely blown away by the presentation, the opening, the closing, the objections. It was fantastic. Um, and again, I didn't know who it was. I was extremely pleased to wake up the next morning and see it was South High School. Uh, and right close behind that, as far as how happy I was, is that the team that they were up against in my courtroom was Arrowhead, and they beat them. So <laughs> they did a, a fantastic job. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you for your presentation, and we'll see you in like three months, I think, still. I, I'm, I think, maybe, Something maybe like not. That. No idea. Think before the end of the year. <laughs> we'll try and get you back. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. Okay, we're now at the uh, section of our meeting where there's an opportunity for citizens to address the board. As has been past practice, we give uh, up to three minutes for each speaker um, to address us. And at the two and a half minute mark, Amanda will give you a signal um, to wrap your comments up in the following 30 seconds. Uh, we expect all speakers to honor our time limit, refrain from being, refrain from using any inappropriate language in any manner, and be respectful in their comments. Uh, speakers who do not meet uh, these expectations may be prohibited from speaking at future Board of Education meetings. We also expect uh, that the audience will be respectful of the speaker and the Board of Education refrain from responding with verbal comments, cheering, applause, or other behavior that will detract from the meeting. And also to uh, respect our speakers and meeting participants, please silence your phones. Um, Sue, did we have anyone si sign up? No, we did not. So you made me go through that whole script? <laughs> oh, you just did it. I thought you needed to <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we'll move on to the next part of our meeting, everyone. <laughs> Which is minute approval. We do have one set of minutes for approval. Uh, January 13th of 2021. Do I have a motion for approval? I make the motion that we approve the minutes as presented for January 13th. Is there a second to that? Second. Second by Amanda. Any discussion? Corrections? Okay, Sue. Please take the roll call vote. Corey Montiel. Aye. William Baumgart. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Karen Reinichek. Aye. Kurt O'Brien. Aye. Amanda Roddy. Aye. Greg Dietz. Abstain. Diane Voigt. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. Passes 801, Sue. Moving on to our communications, uh, Dr. Siebert. Nothing to report, Mr. Como. Okay. Ms. Voigt, do we have uh, a report on Waukesha Education Foundation? Yes, we do. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Waukesha Education Foundation Board of Directors welcomes Sarahi Monterey as our newest teacher liaison to the Waukesha Education Foundation Board of Directors. And she, yeah, as you may know, was our Teacher of the Year, etc. So we're very pleased to have her as one of our representatives at, on the board at this point. The Waukesha Education Foundation has received several notable donations in January. We've received the fourth installment of $7,500. It's an annual pledge over five years that INPRO has made to us, and we're very thankful to INPRO for that that commitment and that long-term donation policy. Um, an anonymous donor has set up a challenge fund now known as the Waukesha Education Foundation Leadership Fund. They've pledged to match up to $10,000 
if we can get donations from former Waukesha Education Foundation board members, uh, school board members, and other district leadership. So the purpose of this fund would be to, at the discretion of the board of directors, to use for funding needs to move the foundation forward. So we'll be sharing more information with you sometime during this next quarter about that particular details. But a $10,000 matching grant is kind of an interesting process. We want to thank Whipley and Aurora Healthcare for renewing their annual sponsorships at the $1,000 silver level, and thank Von Briesen and Roper SC for officially joining us as $1,000 silver sponsors as well. Metal Tech International has renewed their $2,500 gold sponsorship, so a big thank you to them for that sponsorship level. May I have a drum roll, please? Anybody into drum rolls? Um, for my next announcement, it's, it's for the Go Casual for a Cause Dress Down Days. We've raised $11,246. So we must recognize the generosity of all of our amazing staff, and specifically Hillcrest at the elementary level and South at the secondary level for winning the contests that were available. And the um, foundation will be providing a breakfast or lunch to each of those staffs to recognize their donations. And we definitely want to thank Sue Ettinger and all the school secretaries for making this happen. The superintendent has given us the opportunity because of a challenge they met last week Thursday um, to extend it another six weeks. So thank you, Mr. Siebert, for that um, opportunity as well. Um, we're, we're very pleased with um, the, the, the extra six weeks now that we'll be able to continue to, to raise some of the funds in that respect. Um, special thanks to North High School, too. They were just a little bit behind South, but raised over $1,000. So um, the foundation's be dropping off some donuts for North as well. We are now going to put some of those funds to use. Um, next Monday, the window of the grant opportunity, the application opportunity, starts on the 15th and will run until April 9th. Um, Melissa Baxter is, is offering a virtual grant workshop for anyone hearing this that might have an idea for a creative project um, that, that they can attend on February 22nd virtually at 6 p.m. to be able to get some ideas about, you know, if they're a first timer or want to, you know, get some ideas about what they might apply for if they haven't, haven't thought of anything yet. Details are coming together on our website and sponsors are emerging for the Moving Forward Wellness Challenge that I talked about last time. That's gonna be coming our way March 28th to April 24th. So mark your calendars and plan to participate in this wellness event, recording your movement minutes as part of a school team. And my final announcement is an invitation to eat for a good cause. On Friday, um, February 19th, Western Lakes and Saz's Catering have invited us to participate in a Friday fish fry fundraiser. So on February 19th, anything that you order either for carry out or for dining in at the um, Western Lakes would be eligible for 10% to go to the Waukesha Education Foundation. So information will be posted on our website soon and we look forward to having lots of people eat for a good cause. Thank you, Mr. President, that concludes my report. Now my stomach's growling. <laughs> growling. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Hoyt. Now moving on to our charter school and program report given by Mr. Bumgard. Yes, I do have a small report tonight. It got a lot smaller because I was going to talk about AVID, but I can't duplicate what's been done out there by the kids. So the AVID, just be aware, north and south, uh, school-wide uh, uh, sites of distinction. So I'll bypass the rest of that and come up with eAchieve. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Jason Smith connected with me about some of the positive things happening at eAchieve, both at the secondary and the elementary level. Um, the, the, the list was rather strong, and I'm going to put that in, have Sue put that in a packet for Friday, but I'll pick up just a couple of kinds of things that uh, they've talked, talking about things like improved attendance, recognition, student to student collaboration, <clears throat> second. Book clubs, this is at the secondary level, uh, elementary level, community time, music makers club, leadership, collaboration at elementary. I'll just read two sentences or so to you about some of these. Uh, at the, sec at the uh, secondary level, attendance for the weekly class e-sessions is at an all-time high, attributed to both increased enrollments and teachers creating more active learning. Uh, strategies and collaboration of opportunities to engage students 
in this live, these live learning sessions at an elementary level, school-wide launch of community time at each grade level in all of our elementary classes. Teachers infuse social, emotional lessons, offer show, offer show and share, read great books, explore imaginations, hang out and chat. Everything is wonderful. So we've got, again, good things going at eAchieve through some rather difficult times, but uh, you'll get a, a complete list of this in the packet. Okay. That's all I have to report. Thank you, Mr. Bungard. Appreciate that. Uh, moving on to our consent agenda, uh, we'll start with our public gifts. Uh, Darren, would you please report on those? Yeah, one gift tonight. Uh, the Horowitz Dreamer Planetarium received $1,000 from Marge Holzbog to be used towards the Planetarium Lobby Remodel Project. Thank, thank you for that gift. Fantastic. And if you haven't been out to the Planetarium lately, it's, it's, it's a great place to visit. So I highly encourage you to, to get out there. And not just board members that I was looking at, but everyone out there in TV land. It's, it's, a, it's a really spectacular place. There's some great shows for the public. Um, your, your agenda includes various uh, categories for approval. Uh, there were no expulsions uh, this month. So at this time, uh, does any board member wish to have an item set aside for separate consideration? Seeing none, Mr. Bryan, will you please present the uh, consent agenda? Earlier this evening, the Human Resources and Compensation Committee approved 21 retirements, one resignation, two newer modification teacher contracts, and 47 administrative contracts. The information was provided in your packet and an addendum was placed at your desk. I move that the consent agenda be approved as amended. Is there a second to that? Second by Mr. Dietz. Discussion? Yes, Kurt. I want to ask clarification. Uh, 47 administrator contacts? Okay, I want to make sure that's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, on the back side of the initial. Okay, thank you. And just, just briefly, hats off to all of those who have worked in our district for so many years who are retiring. It's, it's always... Uh, Kind of a, a sad and a happy moment. Um, happy for you that you're moving on to, you know, um, uh, your your future, and hopefully you will enjoy your retirement. Uh, but you've impacted us so positively over the course of your career here. It's it's tough to see some of you go. I you know I I think in HR I think I know six or seven of you pretty well uh, of the 21, and you know who you are on the list and. Um, you've, you've impacted my students in very positive manner, or my children in a very positive manner that today they're, they're in their 20s and married, but they still talk about those times that uh, you've impacted them. So um, hats off to you. Thank you for all those years of, of your service to our students. Any other questions or, yes, Kurt? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, this is a tough year, and it's, uh, I know we had at least one or two uh, educators that stayed on because they wanted to finish a year in a normal way. Um, but for any a little bit of luck, that's what our expectation is, is that we will be able to finish this year in a normal way. And uh, so it, I'm glad we were able to get to that point this year, and we did that with a lot of effort by a lot of people, including the community. So. Anyone else? Okay, Sue, please take the roll call vote on the consent agenda. Greg Dietz? Aye. Karen Ranichek? Aye. Corey Montillo? Aye. Patrick McCaffrey? Aye. Diane Voigt? Aye. William Baumgart? Aye. Kurt O'Brien? Aye. Amanda Roddy? Aye. Joseph Como? Aye. Passes 9 0, Sue. Thank you, Kurt. Now, moving on to our superintendent's report given by Dr. Siebert. All right, thank you, Mr. Como. Uh, we're going to do a couple of things in the superintendent's report today. Uh, the first is we are going to walk you through the staff check-in survey that we did in January with the help of school perceptions. And then the second thing after we do that is I will give you a brief update on COVID-19 and vaccinations. So with that being said, uh, you are aware that we did this survey uh, with all of our staff and you're familiar with school perceptions uh, most likely from uh, the referendum survey that you did prior to 2018 with the help of Bill Foster 
Uh, I've had previous experience working with school perceptions as well and find them to be uh, a very good organization to work with. And so what we did here is we surveyed all of our staff members, all of our various employee groups, and we wanted to just kind of get a check on how they were doing and how they were feeling. This pandemic has been a challenge on multiple levels for people, and we wanted to touch base to see how they're doing and if there's things we can do differently to help them. So we had 1,064 responses for an overall participation rate of 67%, which we felt good about. Uh, when we look at the staff information, it broke it down, and you can see, uh, it's a little hard for you to see, but we have representation from every single building. And uh, we also have a, a breakdown of the types of positions that those people held. So obviously classroom teachers were the majority of people that took it, but we also had paraprofessionals, educational specialists, our support staff, administrators, and people qualifying as others. So a good representative sample. And we also looked at uh, their years of experience within the district. And you can see here that we had a nice spread and nice array of experience levels from one to two, uh, all the way up to more than 10 years of experience. So different perspectives from that perspective as well. So then we get into uh, some check-in questions. There was a few different portions of the survey. There's a check-in portion and a learning portion. and. What you're gonna see when we go through the questions is that uh, each question will have the percentage of people that either strongly agreed or agreed, and it will also then have an average score. And when you look above, you'll see that five is strongly agree, three is a neutral comment, and one would be a strongly disagree. So that's the scale. So with that being said, uh, you can see the first one uh, really proud of that one. I have someone at school I can talk to about work-related problems that speaks to the collaborative nature uh, that exists within our buildings in the school district of Waukesha. Uh, earlier tonight, we talked about technology, and you can see that 87% are very satisfied with the technology available to them. Uh, I've been provided the tools and resources needed to do my work. Again, 85% and a 3.94 score. Uh, we then go into uh, some questions around communication regarding COVID. Uh, a little bit lower, 68% and 3.44. The amount of work I'm asked to do is reasonable. Again, a little bit lower, 59% or 3.18. Uh, the district listens to my COVID-related concerns, 56%, 3.08. And I understand the process the district is using to make decisions related to COVID-19, 53% or 3.01. So we spent some time going through this survey with the Superintendent's Advisory Council this afternoon too, and we've asked them to reflect on those areas and things that we could do as a district uh, to help in that area. Some of those pieces are, uh, are difficult from the standpoint that, that COVID changes quite a bit and uh, Dr. Cook and I work together on some of those decisions and we've got the transition criteria now, but if there are things we can do in those areas, we wanna partner certainly with the staff and I'll talk at the end about some of the additional action steps that we'll be taking, uh, but there, there are opportunities for us to look at and see if there's things we can continue to improve upon, certainly. We then asked uh, if you had a COVID-related issue, uh, was the district's leadership responsive? And you see we had 48% said yes, we had 45% that say they did not have such a matter, and we had 7% that said no, so we thought that was good to see. Uh, <clears throat> we asked people how the district has been in responding to their individual concerns, and there we have a combination of 20% great, 40% good for 60% overall, 30% said fair, 10% said poor. And we also, uh, Sharon had given an update on substitute coverage, uh, both in the FNF meeting and then earlier tonight in the HR committee meeting. We picked the month of December so we could have a gauge for them, for people to remember how often they had subbed. Uh, and we were worried, and you, uh, as you know, that stresses people when stresses the system as well, when they're covering during preps and so forth. Uh, and here we found that 43% of people said they hadn't subbed in the month of December, and 44% said they had subbed one to five times. So overall, 87% of people uh, were not having an excessive amount uh, of subbing, at least during the month of December, which was, was good to see. We also asked how people were dealing with COVID-related challenges at school this year. 
Uh, 8% said great, 42% good, 41% fair, and 9% poor. When we talked about it in the Superintendent's Advisory Council, we, we talked about the fact that even a fair in, in COVID-19 and in a pandemic and trying to teach during various learning modalities and models uh, it probably isn't really a, a negative response. I mean, it's if you're doing fair in this time frame, it's, it's probably closer to, to understandable than it that would be otherwise. So, so overall, we, we found that to be uh, an okay result. Let's get into the learning component. And here we ask people to rate how they would rate the district's in-person and how they would rate the district's virtual learning opportunities. And you'll see that in the blue, that's the in-person. 22% of people rated our in-person learning opportunities great, 56% good, uh, which is a nice combination, 19% fair and 3% poor. Uh, the virtual, uh, a little bit lower. We had 11% uh, said great and 44% said good, so 55% total with 35% fair and 10% uh, poor. And uh, we then got into some additional learning questions. Uh, the first one again speaks to the collaboration. When needed, I've received support from my colleagues to assist me in doing my job. Uh, very high scores there. Uh, overall, I feel I've been able to support my students. I thought that was great to see. 85% agreed or strongly agreed. I have access to the instructional tools and coaching that I need to perform my work. Again, that's a credit to both Steve and Jody's departments, 86%, uh, 3.85. And then we get down to another one that's similar to the other ones uh, in the, that we talked about earlier. My schedule provides enough time to prepare and deliver effective instruction, lower, 49%, strongly agree, 2.85. Uh, we, we're reflecting on that in the Superintendent's Advisory Council. We'll reflect on that with the EAW as well next week. Uh, that, I think, it just really points to the fact that people are balancing a number of different plates, and they're trying to teach between different learning models. They have quarantines. They have classrooms that are closed down periodically, then open back up, and they're trying to figure it might be the live streaming as well. Uh, there's a lot of different expectations on our staff this year that traditionally we haven't had, so it, not necessarily surprising to see that and, and ways that we hopefully can continue to support them as we, as we move forward. Uh, this one was, I thought, really nice to see. It said overall, how supportive have your students' parents been this school year? Uh, we had 35% that said very supportive and we had 60% that said somewhat supportive. So we get 95% out of those two, which I thought was great to see. And certainly our parents have had a number of challenges this year as well. And so uh, we thank them for their support uh, of our schools and of our teachers and their children. Uh, this one I thought was exciting to look at too. Uh, overall, how would you rate your interactions with your students this year? Uh, we get between good and great, we get a combination of 85%, uh, which, which is awesome. And we also asked, should you need to teach 100% virtually in the future, how prepared are you? Again, uh, now that we've had some experience with it, 42% uh, feel very prepared, 43% feel somewhat prepared. So there again, we're at 85% of people feeling good with 10% saying it doesn't apply uh, to them because they have a different type of role. And also at this time, we wanted to know how people are feeling about doing in-person instruction. We recognize everybody has different family circumstances, individual health concerns and so forth. And 41% of our staff said they're very comfortable. 38% somewhat comfortable, and 12% were not comfortable at all. So, so overwhelmingly, people are, are comfortable. And then overall, we asked a final question, uh, kind of a one to get a vibe on uh, what they're thinking overall about the district, and it's how likely, would you, how likely would you be to recommend the district to a friend or family member? And what we, what we thought was encouraging about this one is that if you add up everything from a six uh, to a 10, uh, we get 66% of the staff scoring us uh, at a six to 10. If you add in the, 5 the fives, which is the neutrals, we get up to 86%, uh, which means that we had uh, only 14% that were in the, the four or lower. So uh, overall, uh, what we thought is, uh, we find a lot of positives in that data uh, we think our staff has been very resilient and we're very proud of the, the work that they've been doing. Uh, certainly, 
Uh, some of the next steps that we're going to take, as I said, we worked with the superintendent's advisory committee today. They're reflecting on some ideas. We'll talk with the EAW on Monday. We have a meet and confer session with them. Uh, the EAW also did their own survey, so they'll have that on the 15th, and we'll be able to debrief that together. We'll look for some salient themes between those two surveys. And then what we can do is we can work on ideas that we get from both of those groups, as well as ideas at the building level and the district level, uh, to further support the staff so that they can continue to perform optimally for their kids, uh, for each other, and uh, have some work-life balance here as we continue to work our way through this pandemic that we find ourselves in. So with that, let me just stop and, and ask if you have any questions. Mr. Bryan? Sorry. Sure. Are you able to go backwards on the slides that shows the, the satisfaction of teachers as um, that one to 10 scale? Oh, yeah, right here. So when I look at that, I think the most important thing is that we have 54% that rates us from eight and above, which is very good. Mm -hmm. I think that's an extremely good number. Um, considering the challenging year we had, I think that speaks well of our staff and, and our, our school as a whole and the parents and the students. High number that are yeah, I, recommended. I, I think you're right, Mr. O'Brien. You know, I think when getting around to the schools more regularly now, uh, what you really see is people banding together and you see teachers being very positive. You see support staff positive. You see great collaboration between the principals and the staff. I think those are all signs of a productive and collaborative culture, which is the key to continuing to get better. And then I'd also like to compliment the administration on using someone like School Perceptions to help frame the survey, gather information. I think if we're going to go to this effort to poll people, it's important to do a good poll to get good information. So I'd like to compliment the administration on that. Thank you. Anyone else for questions? For on the survey, Dr. Siebert. All right, well, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, then let's just go into a little bit of a, a COVID and vaccine update. So we're trying to do uh, weekly updates uh, for you as well as for the staff uh, so that we can stay on top of this and people have their questions answered as best as possible. It's fair to say that all of this information changes very rapidly, uh, if not daily. Uh, and sometimes a couple times a day. Uh, so we do our best to stay on top of it. And, and Dr. Cook and I and Sharon work very closely together on it. So as of last Wednesday, there was 43,000 county residents who had received at least one dose of the vaccine. And we also, as of today, learned that 30% of our 65 plus age group in Waukesha County has received one dose of the vaccine. So those are, those are positive statistics. Uh, the COVID case numbers in the district, as well as the county are stable. Uh, and actually slightly decreasing. Overall, our dashboards look really, really good. And uh, as you know, I think the vaccine, the focus of the vaccination continues to be on people in what are termed tier 1A. And those tiers are established by the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. So tier 1A consists of frontline healthcare personnel, residents in skilled nursing and long-term care facilities, uh, police and fire personnel, as well as correctional officers and staff, and also adults age 65 or over. So that's where the focus is right now. And then educators and childcare workers are in what's called tier 1B, which is the next group. And the good news is they're prioritized at the top of tier 1B. So they will be the first people to get vaccination when we get to that point. And the Wisconsin Department of Health Services has established a date of March 1st, all dependent on vaccine supply for us to begin with tier 1B, which is educators. The challenge we have is that with vaccine supply is currently Wisconsin is only able to fill 25% of the requests for vaccine that they're getting from counties and healthcare systems. And so last week they received 320,000 requests, the state of Wisconsin, they only had 80,000 doses to distribute. So in Waukesha County specifically, uh, I had told you in the update last week that they had asked for 7,000 doses of vaccine and they actually got 1,000. So while the county started their mass clinic this Monday uh, at the Expo Center and is available and able to do 1,000 shots a day, 
the challenge is when you only get a thousand for the whole week, uh, you obviously can't you know do the full capacity that they're they're capable of. However, uh, as of today, we've had approximately 115 of our staff that have had the opportunity to become vaccinated because they've been able to fit into Tier 1A. And so Dr. Cook and Sharon have been working along with the nurses uh, with the county and ProHealth to make that happen. So that's been our nurses, our healthcare, health room staff and backups, and then some of our special ed services like occupational therapists, physical therapists, people that work with medically fragile children. So we do have a start uh, within the school district of Waukesha, which, which has been great. So what we do is we continue to plan in conjunction with Waukesha County. It's most likely that our staff will, when it becomes March 1st or when the vaccine supply becomes accessible to us, uh, we will work as county school districts to work through the county, likely through the Expo Center, uh, to have our people vaccinated as quickly as possible. And we certainly will be ready when the county is ready for us. There is just a number of people within Tier 1A, uh, particularly in the 65 plus age group, that still need to go through the process and before we will get to Tier 1B and educators. So uh, we'll continue to learn. We'll continue to update you and, and the staff as frequently as we can. And I think the key to this whole thing is going to be continued patience. We're going to have to be very flexible because when the time is right, we're going to we're going to have to pull people and do what we need to do and, and get them over to the Expo Center and uh, get them taken care of. And then we just have to really continue to commit to our, our proven mitigation strategies, not only in the school district, uh, but in the community. Because while we wait for the vaccine, we can still be effective with masks and hand washing and social distancing to the extent that we possibly can achieve it. So, so that's about all I have on that front, and, and it changes, uh, I'll continue to give you the updates, it just changes a lot, and uh, I'm very grateful that we have a collaborative county and collaborative county school districts uh, to work with. It's, it's, been a, it's been a joy. Any questions for Dr. Siebert? All right, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, moving on to our committee reports. As you know, we do rotate which committee uh, starts off. And this month we are going to start with safety and security given by Mrs. Reincheck. Mr. President, the safety and security meeting uh, did not meet, but we do have a meeting coming up on February 15th. At okay, thank you. Moving on to human resources and compensation committee given by Mr. O'Brien. Actually, uh, I don't have anything to report tonight, uh, um, Mr. President. I do have a, a brief summary provided by Ms. Thede uh, in regard to subs. Because we had additional new information from F&F &F the other night, and we thought we should share that with the full Well, board. you have a special guest is what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so I have someone who's much more talented than speaking about it. <laughs> yeah. Why, thank you, Mr. O'Brien. <laughs> Okay, so the new information I presented at F and F and then earlier tonight at HR, but something I did not mention at F and F um, was just a reminder that we do have building subs in several of our schools. It's something that we had had and it went away and it's back. So we have them at our high schools. Um, we also hired a couple district building subs that were able to utilize as needed. So I just wanted to provide that additional information as an add on to what I talked about at F and F that I did mention in HR. Anything else you'd like me to mention, Mr. O'Brien? Just that uh, essentially um, the report has been favorable in terms of our fill rates on subs and, and support for staff. Um, it, that's the report you gave at both F and F and HR. Right, the dashboard puts us in the red, but when you look at the teacher numbers, which is the majority of our staff, we are in the 80, 80 85, 83% range. Not ideal, we'd like to be in the 90s normally. We'd like to be 100%, but in a non-pandemic year, we're always looking to be above 90%. So it's not, uh, it, it's, we can always work on it, but it just wasn't um, quite as negative as that dashboard shows for the teacher perspective. But again, anyone watching, if you'd like to sub, you can go to our district webpage and under Departments Human Resources, click the link and you can apply. You need a graphic for that. With sound effects. <laughs> yes, Mr. Ryan. And according to our school perception survey, you can ask our teachers, it's a great place to work. Exactly. That concludes my report. 
Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Moving on to policy given by Mr. Bumgarner. Yes, um, policy committee uh, met. We have two action items and one discussion item this evening. The first action item is a new policy 2261.03 district and school report card. This, this was a new policy that describes the Title I's requirement to, pre to prepare report cards specific to the Title I services and incorporate a reference to the state accountability report. Um, in, a in a response to the question at the January Policy Committee meeting, Title I report cards are reported to the public by December 15th, following the end of a given school year. In comparison, the school district report, the regular one you're used to report, is due to the public by November 30th. So they're not the same cards. One is for Title I stuff, and the other one is the one we do regularly. Um, this, uh, this, this new policy has been reviewed at, at the pro and approved at the policy committee meeting. This is our second round with the full board. At this time, I would like to move for approval of this new policy as presented. Is there a second to that? Thing by Mr. Mantillo. Discussion? Okay, Sue, take the roll call vote. Kurt O'Brien. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Greg Dietz. Aye. Amanda Roddy. Aye. William Baumgart. Aye. Diane Voigt. Aye. Corey Mantillo. Aye. Karen Reinicek. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. Passes 9 0, Sue. Bill? Thank you. The second action item is a revision to policy 5200 attendance. Revisions have been made to this policy to allow for the expanded definition of what constitutes attendance at the district's at the district's program. Specifically to account for the virtual instruction formats that may require a certain measure of attendance different from physical presence in a classroom. Uh, but, Basically, this is adding to the, the attendance requirements something on virtual attendance because it was rather undefined previously. Uh, at this point, I would like to move for approval of this policy, 5200 on attendance at this time. Is there a second to that? Second by Mrs. Boyd? Yeah. Discussion? Comments, questions? Okay, Sue, please take the roll call vote. Amanda Roddy. Aye. Diane Voigt. Aye. Corey Montiel. Aye. Kurt O'Brien. Aye. Karen Reinicek. Aye. Greg Dietz. Aye. William Baumgart. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. Passes 9-0, Sue. Bill? Okay, and we have a discussion item, new policy 8395, student mental health uh, services. This new policy incorporates mental health service delivery models recommended by DPI. Um, this is a new item. Uh, it will be making its rounds through the board and the committee for, the, for full approval in March. Any feedback at this time? Yes, Mr. Ryan. It may be not completely related, but um, it may be something that I'm not sure if policy is the best place to handle it and whether it's related to this policy or a new policy. But um, I, I would like us to have a discussion at policy or via the administration on duty to report um, in our bullying policy. In our what? In, our bull, in, a, in the bully policy. You know, okay. Um, what's the duty of staff to report and how is it reported and how is it handled? I don't know if that's covered in these three topics or if that has to be a new topic for policy sometime in the future. So, Mr. Cook? Yeah, we certainly can bring that forward at policy. We do have a policy on bullying, and we have um, the, uh, uh, well, the speak out uh, uh, stuff that was put out by the uh, Department of Justice. Uh, we are part of that. So we can certainly do an update to the board on what we're doing, have a discussion at policy um, about the components of the bullying policy and what's required for reporting. So. I bring this up because, not because of anything that happened in the school district of Waukesha, but I've heard um, an example elsewhere, let's say some other state, just to make it safe, where a bullying incident may have occurred and um, prior incidents that could have been interpreted as bullying were not reported. So that's why I'm concerned about, you know, just like we have with the assault issues, it's very clear by state statute what that is, but I don't know if there's a statute that governs 
reporting incidences that could be bullying. So. We'll make sure we review that at committee um, and then update a Friday update to the board, kind of an overview of what we have as far as bullying goes and, and the number of programs that we have to support that in the district. So pronged approach to my initial hearing on that would be that bullying will be separate from this particular policy. We a can mental, talk about that, but yeah. it seems to be quite a separate item, especially after you look at this policy. Yeah, we have an anti-bullying policy yes. that will take care of bullying, and this is this is more of the supportive services for kids. So for the kids um, that need it, yeah. I can see how you'd bring it up, Kurt. I mean, under it's fine. the mental health umbrella. I yes. just wanted to have a chance to bring it up, so I just thought this was the opportunity. Fine. So. Um. That was a discussion item. Any other? About it again. Any other comments, questions? Provide to Bill in the committee. Hey, Bill. Uh, the next policy committee meeting is scheduled for next Tuesday, February 16th. I will advise everybody right now we have a lot of things on the agenda uh, in terms of bylaws that are going to be reviewed and policies that are going to be reviewed. And I ask you, please, if you are going to be interested in discussing any of these, get started on it this weekend. So that's all I have. Fair enough. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for giving us a heads up on that. Moving on to our technology co committee given by Mrs. Voigt. I'm, I'm reading my script here from our, our oh. recognized tech department tonight. We um, had a chance to meet on Monday, February 8th, and there are no action items or information items on the agenda, but there are a lot of discussion items. We had a chance to talk about a lot of the things that he was able to highlight a little bit you know, during the recognition earlier this evening. Um, as you go down through the agenda, um, several of them are combined, so I may not be having as many separate discussion items as what you see on the list, but the Technology Committee reviewed current live streaming statistics compiled from the district WebEx platform Total meetings numbers and total meeting minutes continue at the same pace as they have for the last several months. But total meeting participant numbers are down over 25% because of the change to face-to-face. -to -face. These statistics confirm our shift um, from the hybrid model to the full five days face-to-face, -face, where we are still providing daily streaming, but most students are face-to-face. -face. New WebEx features were also discussed, which will result in the merging of WebEx teams and meetings. These features will roll out on, on February 26th. So this is a discussion item, and I, one of the things that I wanted to, to share is that we're on version number 41 of updates to WebEx. So they've been doing a lot <laughs> on the tech side to, to tweak the things that aren't working and make the changes, et cetera. And I think that that is a real, a real tribute to the, our, our team and how well they're working through the transitions that we're involved in. Any other questions or? Yeah. Yes, Seriously, Mr. Longard. 41 updates. Is for this WebEx. Is that since we started using this? Well, it's WebEx 41. So I think they've been doing it for, you know, this isn't the first year we're using WebEx. No, we've been using so it's not just the last 11 months? No, no. Okay. I just but they just, keep improving. The yeah, point well, is, I, that's it, good to hear, but yeah. Yeah, I was kind of shocked by the number. It is, it is. And I think the other point that I'd like to share is that we, we've done the WebEx, and you get the little chance to do the little survey right at, after you use it each time, and the ratings tend to be um, very high, like over four, four and fives on most of the people's involvement there. So that's you know, kind of a daily opportunity to be able to get feedback if things aren't working well. So next topic is the committee discussed the importance of students' understanding of ergonomics and the effects of excessive screen time that has, that has on, a, on a person's body. Um, members viewed the district's digital citizenship curriculum on commonsense.org. It's an excellent free web resource that helps students understand the importance of this online offline balance for their life. And the curriculum is presented to all K to 12 students in the district. This was one of the items that I had a concern about, like too much screen time can not be a good thing, especially when we're talking 4K already in kindergarten, et cetera. And I was really pleased to see in the digital citizenship curriculum that you, if you go to the, the um, PowerPoint that's in the website, you can click the link and actually get to see the full curriculum. And right away at kindergarten, it's a happy balance between our online and offline activities. You know, in first grade, you know, it's what's important that we have device-free moments in our lives. You know, so you're giving even the littlest ones the opportunity to realize that, you know, you need to have screen, screen breaks. So that was 
just one of the things I thought was really an important feature to know. Any other discussion? All right, then the next discussion item focused on the synergies between eAchieve and the traditional brick and mortar classrooms. Since eAchieve is a technology-based school, the district IT department has always played a key role in supporting them as well as all the rest of the, 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 the brick and mortar schools. The commitment of the district to simplify and make consistent use of Blackboard as the learning, learning environment um, has really helped to bring a lot more alignment between what eAchieve is doing in our traditional classrooms. And I think it's really significant to know that you know, going back to IQ Academy of Wisconsin, you know, the beginnings of eAchieve, you know, that, that tech support has been going on for, you know, 14 years, is it, or so? So that, that's, you know, again, a tribute to our initiatives to one-on-one -on -one in the classroom. But, you know, it's, it's been amplified through that program twice as long in terms of technology support. Um, the next topic, we move into the category of infrastructure. We've already talked about surveys, so we don't need to touch, touch base on that here again. Um, renovation work is moving ahead of schedule at Butler and Les Paul, and they've had occupied their new offices and classroom spaces. The communication with our contractors, Findorf and Aldrich Electric, has been outstanding and has allowed us to make a seamless transition into these new spaces with the technology in those environments. So I think that that's a very positive, too. And related to that, we're, we're scheduled for the tour of Les Paul and South in April. So we'll all get a chance to see some of that in face-to-face. In -face. So that's a really good thing. Any other discussion? Um, next then, I'd asked about the hotspots. And, and when students do have limited access to um, technology, there are 50 of the 60 district purchased Wi-Fi hotspots have been deployed to families in need of Wi-Fi service. The Student Services Department continues to access the need and recommend f families for this service as needed. So basically the social workers make that kind of connection. And it's nice to know that only 50 have been needed. We have 10 in reserve. You know, so it's not like we didn't have enough to go around for all the needs that were there. So that was a, a real positive report as far as I was concerned. Um, the next topic was additional IT expenses related to the COVID were discussed. The expenses focused mainly on like the new WebEx carts, which are actually, you know, a total of $147,000 investment in, because, of, you know, because of that new, new services um, that were purchased to allow quarantine teachers to instruct from home. The School District of Waukesha was in a much better position technology-wise, as, as Steve mentioned earlier, because of our commitment to Waukesha One over, over the last seven years. So I think that, that, that's this, my report and, and his recognition really is, is important to recognize that. Um, while other districts are scrambling to purchase and deploy large numbers of student and staff devices, we are well you know, suited in that respect and able to focus on the content and the delivery models, which, you know, puts us like light years ahead of a lot of other districts. Um, the, board, the board's commitment to Waukesha One should be applauded as it, it enabled the district to provide an excellent, you know, quick response to the switch to virtual learning that we've had to experience because of COVID. And I'd just like to echo what Mr. O'Brien pointed out earlier, it's, it's really the commitment of our citizens too, our taxpayers who really made that uh, become a reality because without, without those funds, you know, obviously we can't get anything done. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very fortunate to, to have that as a funding source. So, compliments to the taxpayers that make this happen as well. Mm -hmm. All right, our next to discussion topic um, is board docs. One year ago, we started looking into the transition to board docs, and that platform is now fully functional, and the committee discussed what it'll take to be able to move to the next level of our involvement um, so we're not duplicating efforts in, black, in, in board docs um, and a paper system that we're going, that's going along with it. So that's a discussion item that's, I guess, an action question to ask all of the, all of our you know, members. Um, I'd like to compliment Bill and the policy committee. Um, as we were talking about the, the volume of work that goes through um, policy, this is all I took to the last meeting and all I brought home from the last meeting. Everything was in board docs. And you know, as we're talking, used to be half inch thick mm. you know, packets that everybody on the, on the board would be getting copies of. I think that's an amazing example of, of the, 
the um, taking advantage of the electronic files that are possible through the board docs program. So at this point, do we need more training? Was one of the questions that you know were to find out from the rest of the board to be able to start to use more doc, board docs more effectively. Any any takers on that? I feel any thoughts on that? Enough. Are are you, are you guys all training. certified as trainers now? So you're ready to train others. We're going to go out to other boards. <laughs> I, I think it's actually gone uh, pretty well. There are some things that, um, you know, uh, still are difficult, like scripts. Um, you know, scripts are a little, little difficult. We haven't figured out how, how to handle those. Um, you know, signing up for the speakers <laughs> who, who, who come and visit us and want to address us. You know, so there's components there. But I think we've made some, some good strides. The packets do continue to get smaller. And, um, you know, the only other thing is, is when we're dependent on this and, it, you know, everything has to work still, just like everything else for any technology. So any suggestions, comments? I mean, I think we're moving in the right direction. Yes, Mr. O'Brien. You know, as long as we're getting the agendas emailed to us, um, and if we get all the rest of the information on board docs, um, I think it's very possible to, for us to move away to a more paperless system in the very near future, if not tomorrow. So I think the fact that the agendas are mailed to us, emailed to us, I mean, it mailed, and that board docs seems to be working well, I think we're moving closer and closer to a paperless situation. And right now, it's like double work or triple work for staff to handle duplicate systems. More we can consider moving in that direction, probably the better. Any other comments? I think the efficiency of electronic files to know where to go back and find, you know, like that certain policy or whatever, rather than shuffling through packs of papers to be able to find that type of thing. I think there's a lot of merits to that. The transparency to the community to be able to have access to you know, the kinds of things that we're talking about, like just as a click there, if they can't physically be here, especially with COVID, you know, to be able to still see an agenda you know, as part of the, 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 the board docs of information that's available online and some things like that, I think are good for the community as well to have it in this context and be able to have the minutes available a month after the meeting, you know, et cetera, they can have that kind of you know, information available tied to a meeting per se. The next question is, do we still need to have a Friday packet mailed to us at all? At what point could we get rid of that, you know, shuttled kind of distribution process? Mr. Baumgart. But Kurt was just addressing at least having a copy of the agenda. And right now I'd agree with you on that. It steers you to where you want to look for the policy number or whatever it is. Talk about that, That's, that would be my reaction also. But if you get the agenda, then you have the links right there. It's like you don't even have to go into board docs per se to be, you know, it, well, you just click it and you get right, clicks right to the agenda. Mr. Montillo? Yeah, thank you. I like seeing Mike every Friday. Um, my dog doesn't too much. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but he's always a pleasure. I do like getting the packets, we do, uh, quite often get some confidential information. So um, I love board docs. I think it's been fantastic uh, with Mrs. Boyd said about being able to look back on what we've done before and access the policies. Uh, I think it's been very, very nice. If we could find out some way to transmit those confidential documents, that makes it I would miss Mike, but save the gas. I still have a tendency to, to uh, jot down notes and things. That's one of the reasons why I like paper. Um, I think if we go to a full electronic system, we're going to have to get pretty good at annotations. If you don't know how to annotate now, you should start practicing. And that might be an area that I could see we could use some training in. Um, it's... Uh, 
And the, the other thing uh, about the annotations is you have to be fairly organized with what you're doing there. So for example, it takes down, it, 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 it remembers your annotations in the order that you put them in. So what I found to be still a little difficult is if I annotate here, but then I jump back to the back page and I put in annotation, and then I jump to the middle page, you know, my annotations aren't necessarily right next to the part that I want to talk about. So it's like I got to kind of come up with a strategy like, oh, that's on page two, you know, or whatever. This is an annotation for page two or for this paragraph. Or it's, it's easier for policy because, yeah. you know, it's a line. It's a line that you can, you can actually, Big. you know, but, you know, you don't have that necessarily with, with all of the, well, one step at a time. Your mic's not on, Bill. Oh. My, my comment was that we need to take this one step at a time, and I, and I don't know if we're ready for that, all of that yet. Yeah, so, uh, so we if we get away... everybody to looking up stuff in board, board docs yet, and we don't even have a decent way to start board docs the way it's set up. You know, you have to go to board policies instead of some other place. So there's a little, little pieces at a time we have to work with on that one, on that one. And I don't know if there, you know, if there's some enhanced annotation or some different annotation software that we can look at that helps with the one thing that I had pointed out to Ann. If you could maybe bring that up to Steve. Some we had we had attempted. Oh, because he's been our helper in that respect too. Other comments, questions? Yes, Mr. Ryan. Yeah, I mean, logging on the board docs. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Logging on the board docs, you go directly to the board docs site, and then that brings it up. And with the Apple system, the passwords are all stored in there and everything, so it's just a thumb, thumb thing to get that login. So that's convenient. Um, I've never done annotations on it. Um, for those people that feel that they would like to use annotations, I'm sure there's some training on that. If we're not ready to go fully virtual yet, we're not ready to go fully virtual yet. But there should be come a time where we're starting to move that way. So, okay. Good night. Thank you for, for that discussion. And definitely, I think we can talk about the additional training that yeah, can be potentially provided to help us to feel more comfortable with the transition. Um, then the last topic is life safety related technology, and. This is pertaining to First View bus tracking app that allows parents to, and administrators to track the bus progress of the route. The system has been in, in operation since September 8th, and approximately 600 families are taking advantage of it. So families can now get more information on the district website if they'd like to add, if they aren't currently taking advantage of that program. But what's really cool is that school administrators and parents can see if the bus is running late, you know, estimated time of arrival, you know, they can go into the app and see that it's three houses down. It's time to send the kids out in this cold minus 20 degree temperature to be able to pick up the bus, et cetera. And I think it's just an amazing feature that we had been previewed last year and then, and then it, it didn't get started because of second semester's, you know, issues. And I, I'm just really pleased to see that 600 families are taking advantage of that first view um, program at this point. So any discussion about that? If not, that's my last item. Thank you. That concludes my technology report. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to finance and facilities given by Mr. McCaffrey. Thank you, Mr. President. I have no action items on the agenda this evening, but I have five discussion information items. The first discussion information item is a long-term debt review. Michelle Weiberg from PMA joined us to discuss our current debt position. After all, April 1st, 2021 payments are made, the district will have already repaid 36% of the referendum debt, saving over $1.5 million in interest. To capitalize on further interest savings, we will be looking at the potential of refinancing a portion of the outstanding principal balance. Only $5.2 million of the total $38.2 million of the remaining outstanding debt is eligible for refinancing on a tax-exempt basis. Any questions or comments on that? 
Mr. Montiel. Thank you. Um, the presentation that was given at FNF was fantastic. There's a lot of good questions. I would just ask if any board members, if they haven't already watched it, please watch it. Uh, and members of the public, it's easy to, for us to kind of hit the high points on this, but this is a big deal uh, by Mr. Clark and his staff and the other administrators. They've spent our the taxpayers' money in a way that saves the taxpayers a lot of money um, and protects the district. So, well job or job well done, and uh, please watch that presentation. It was, it was really, really good. Agreed. The, the gist of the presentation is the $5.2 million is a bank loan that we uh, had taken out, and that is what is eligible for refinancing. The rest is um, bonding issues. So, yeah, so I agree. A, Great presentation from Michelle. As a board and an administration, we've been very aggressive at paying down and um, actually borrowing for a short period of time. I mean, most districts, uh, districts would have a, a referendum borrow that we took out spread out over 20 years. And we may be finished as soon as six, just to put it in perspective. And that is true savings to our taxpayers. So just wanted to put that in perspective, Mr. Chairman. Alrighty. Uh, is there any other discussion on that? Okay. Our second information discussion item is the prescription drug plan. Specialty prescription drugs cost the district approximately $2.6 million per year, which is 68% of our annual prescription spend. Jeff Schultz from HNI discussed the process change to reduce this growing cost. The prescription drug coverage will not change for an employee or their family. Simply, the process to garner their specialty prescriptions. The process change will look to maximize pharmaceutical companies' copay cards and patient assistance programs in an effort to offset expenses otherwise incurred by the district employees and or the district health plan. Conservatively, we are looking at $1 million in annual savings. Based on the current level of utilization, this process change will affect only 42 of our covered members, which will allow us to better customize a smooth transition for these staff members. The other 99% of the staff will see no change from our current process. Questions or comments? Mr. Montiel. Thank you. This is another one where the presentation given was excellent. This subject, when you're talking about people's prescriptions and health care, pops a lot of red flags. And there was a lot of hard questions asked at that committee meeting. Um, it is a, a program that is somewhat ingenious. Um, it takes advantage of those, the prescription, I'm sorry, I can't think of that. Manufacturers of the prescription drugs. Specialty? The, yes, uh, their discount programs um, and actually will save our employees and people using that system some money um, as far as what they would expend normally towards their co pays. Um, yeah, so it, 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 there's going to be a lot of questions, I'm sure. Please watch the presentation. Um, it was well done. I would agree. Watch the presentation on that because um, it is amazing how much some of those drugs cost. Yeah. Um, and I would agree that HNI has been fantastic. Um, working with. And this isn't just a, this strategy, if we adopt it, is not just a one-time savings. It's year after year after year. And as new specialty drugs come out and are prescribed to our members, it will help with keeping the cost down for future drugs that haven't been invented yet. Uh, a quick yes. uh, side note to that. Today we met with... Uh, Dr. Siebert's Superintendent Advisory um, Council, which is a teacher rep from each building, and we did an abbreviated version of this, and we didn't take a straw vote at the end, but there wasn't, you know, as, as Mr. Mantillo mentioned, when you get into health care, it's very personal, um, and, and the reaction was, um, I think, at least fair. Um, we'll also be meeting with um, the union leadership next week, and we're doing the same abbreviated presentation, so we're trying to gather as many questions as we can because it is a technical thing. It's not an area that much of us in this room have any experience with. Um, so we're trying to get as many questions and as much input so we can come back with a very refined um, presentation to F and F and if necessary the board in in March. Thank you. Mr. McCaffrey? Alrighty. Um, my third information discussion item is the budget development uh, for federal funding update. Ms. Stack provided an update on the federal relief funds we are expecting as part of the FEMA and ESSER grants. 
The plan is to first utilize federal funds, allowing the district to better utilize local dollars to offset future budget shortfalls based on our timeline and priorities. Questions? Questions? No. All righty. Uh, our, my fourth uh, information discussion item is a monthly budget report. Revenues and expenditures continue to be within budgeted limits for both the general and special education fund. The district is operating in accordance with our approved budget and all other funds as well. Questions on the budget? No. Uh, my fifth item has already been gone over. It was the substitute teacher report. Um, so that concludes my report, Mr. President. Our next meeting will be March 8th, 5.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. Moving on to teaching and learning, given by Mr. Dietz. Thank you, Mr. President. The last teaching and learning committee meeting was held on February 2nd, 2021 at 6 p.m. here in the boardroom. Three discussion information items appear on your agenda for teaching and learning this evening. The first discussion information item was a kindergarten through fifth grade phonics update. In May of 2020, the board approved the Benchmark Phonics Word Study Workshop Program for grades kindergarten through fifth. Melissa Yao, Director of Elementary Learning, and Emily Freeman, Elementary Literacy Coach, provided details on how year one of the implementation is going, including professional development, teacher student feedback, and next steps. She also reported that uh, the program was being well received by students and teachers. And um, I think it's really important that uh, we have a district wide program instead of uh, maybe different schools doing their own thing. So that was kind of an add on at the end. But um, I really um, was encouraged by what I was hearing uh, from that group during that presentation. Questions, comments? Okay, Greg. The second discussion information item was the Whittier Elementary School Achievement Grant Reduction Update. One of the requirements of the Achievement Gap Reduction Grant is to present twice a year to the Board of Education on how the grant is being implemented. Whittier Principal Brandy Hart shared the strategy chosen to reduce the achievement gap, which is small classroom sizes, 18 students or less in kindergarten through third grade. She also shared the current achievement data for students at the identified grade levels. Whittier's achievement gap reduction data record keeping template was also included in your board packet last week. Questions or comments? Yes, Bill. I thought one of the most interesting parts of her comments, for those of you that weren't there, dealt with the relationship building between the staff and the kids. There, there was. I don't think we've ever talked about that very much in the past, but the the movement that she's got in mind over there is to get all of the kids and all of the teachers to begin to know each other so that they can meet and talk, say, hi, Joel, or whatever it might be, as opposed to being ambivalent to who that other person is. And um, I, I thought it was very well presented and has an awful lot of power to it. Uh, and, and already they're beginning to show that. I had a conversation today with Emily just by coincidence in the hall and uh, who spent a lot of time, Freeman, who spent a lot of time over at Whittier and she had the same reaction to it. This is, this is going to be powerful. So. I've had some parents too um, comment on how great the program is over at Whittier and I feel blessed that their children are, are able to attend Whittier. Mr. O'Brien. Yeah, I mean, she did an excellent presentation. I, th I think we had a problem with the, did we have a problem with the uh, IT that, so we ended up. Yeah, we, we did. And yeah, we ended up cutting hers a little short as we tried to correct our <laughs> IT problems, but. We had to recess and regroup and. Yeah, all yeah. in an effort to make sure that we have access out there, but. Um, but she didn't leave running, she was happy. <laughs> no, no, and she, re she received a very favorable report. Um, the reality is, is, is that um, more than just small class size, <coughs> There's other things that we need to do to close the achievement gap. And I think it was excellent that she's following a strategy that she could define to us, show us, and she had a map, an achievement map up there that was pretty impressive uh, between high achieving, low achieving, high, low growth and high growth students. And um, so it was a much, um, 
appreciated presentation that uh, gave us information on how students are doing in that school and strategies to make them um, them and their parents more engaged in the school community to improve results. So it was it was impressive, and, and I was pleased that she gave this information. And Whittier is a great school, so anyone who's in that attendance area that's not going there, check it out. Yeah, I, I concur with you that the the data the data the four quadrants right those are that's the data that you're talking about scattergram map or whatever um, that that of all the components of the presentation was I think meaningful and um, we could understand how those components were coming together and what the results were of their efforts so. Keep that one. <laughs> Keep reporting on that one because that, that really was helpful how that data was organized. Yes, Greg. Good. The third discussion information item uh, was high school students semester progress report. Our high, our high school administrative team has been discussing and taking action on data around progress grades for students since November when they were first released. Principal Ryan Pat from West, Kristen Higgins from North, and Kevin Kitzlar from South joined Director of Secondary Learning, Rachel Herman, to report out on what each of our high schools has been doing to help maximize student success. Our administrative team and counseling team have been working closely to address the barriers that the pandemic has put on students and families throughout the various learning models. South teachers, A.J. Rabel and Patty Fossman, presented the data on their efforts to help close these learning gaps for students at South. Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning, Jody Landish, reported that it is more important than ever that we work together to achieve high levels of learning for all of our students. We are confident that through a continued partnership and shared collaboration between our staff, students, and our families, that we will continue to make positive progress at all of our sites. High school progress and virtual learning numbers were also included in last week's board packet. Any questions or comments on that? Mr. Ryan. Um, one of the things that uh, was covered was the achievement gaps at the school and, if, and the superintendent's report, which is under teaching learning update. Um, I just want people to be aware that we are working closely with Principal Ryan Pat to identify what ad, what attributed to this success, so that we can replace it at uh, replicate it at the other schools. West had a very good recovery of students, and um, North and South not quite so good. So, I want to see if there's can be lessons learned that can be shared. So that's underway. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. President. That concludes the Teaching and Learning Committee report for this evening. Our next meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 at 6 p.m. here in the boardroom. Thank you. I'm moving on to Government Relations Committee, given by Ms. Roddy. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, we have no report tonight. However, our next meeting is scheduled for March 1st at 9 a.m. here in the boardroom. Thank you. That concludes our committee reports. Uh, moving on to our other business. Any recommendations for items to be agendized at the full board meeting or potentially um, at committee meeting? Ms. Ryan, check. Thank you, Mr. President. Can we start looking at ways to decrease the quarantines? So you want to have quarantines and how we're quarantine looked at? And yes, and if it's excessive or if it's if other districts are doing things differently and if they are decreasing them, in what ways is that working? In what ways can we try to do the sure. same? All of that. Sure. Okay. Other suggestions? Okay, thank you for that. Um, we do... I don't think we need B, do we, Mr. Clark, no, for closed session? But no, we don't yep. But we do have a need for item C um, under other business, so I'd be looking for a, a motion to go into closed session. I 
I believe that is correct, right? We do need C. Mr. Baumgart. I move that we adjourn to executive session per Wisconsin statutes 19.85 parentheses one parentheses C to consider employment promotion compensation and performance evaluation of any public employee over which the government body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility to discuss 2020 to 2021 salary and percentage increases for executive administrators. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second by Mr. McCaffrey. Sue, will you please take the roll call vote? Karen Reinecek. Aye. Amanda Roddy. Aye. Diane Voigt. Aye. William Baumgart. Aye. Corey Montillo. Aye. Kurt O'Brien. Aye. Patrick McCaffrey. Aye. Greg Dietz. Aye. Joseph Como. Aye. Passes 9 0, Sue. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll go into closed session and we will gotcha. possibly reconvene into open session. It just depends on how it goes in closed session. So uh, how about if we take a, a quick five minute break? And start things up again. Okay, we're back out of closed session and I would be looking for a motion uh, regarding the 2021 salaries for our executive administrators. Mr. Baumgart? Bill, you need to turn the... Sorry, I would move for uh, the salaries that have been discussed and calculated for our five administrators, administering five administrators as, as uh, brought to fact in our meeting. One, one friendly amendment, executive administrators? Executive administrators, yes. yeah. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Second by Amanda? Discussion? Okay, Diane, will you please take the roll call vote? Aye. 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 Passes 9 0, Diane. And that concludes our meeting tonight. We stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guy. Did you send?